Chapter 12, The Fifty-Foot Leap I wakened to the gentle pressure of warm lips on mine and the sound of our soul notes beginning to resonate in my mind. I responded eagerly and soon joined Carol in the ecstasy of physical and e-mental contact. These delights grew in awareness and intensity until the unifying joy of macro immersion was ours. As we lay quietly, still happily entwined, I thought once again of how different my sexual experiences with Carol had been from those of my micro past. Before Carol and my macro immersions, I had always felt either guilty or fearful or simply unfulfilled by my sexual experiences. I wondered if anyone had ever attained macro immersion before the macro society. It was very rare, Carol answered my thought, and most of the time it took place between twin souls. Since twin souls rarely incarnate together, I said, that goes a long way toward explaining the sexual frustrations of microman. Sexual relationships which do not attain macro immersion are only a fleeting satisfaction, Carol explained. Wait a minute, I said. That means that the vast majority of sexual relationships prior to the macro society have not been fulfilling. That's right, Carol nodded. They usually left the participants with a strong underlying desire to start over again, since their true longing was unfulfilled. Then you're saying that any sexual relationship between you and me that does not reach macro immersion would be unfulfilling. That's right, Carol replied. Now you can appreciate how unselfish the other girls of our Alpha were being when they agreed to have a sexual relationship with you if you desired. They knew, I said, that their soul notes were too dissimilar from mine to attain macro immersion, yet to help me learn this, they were willing to experience an unsatisfying union. However, Carol added, to the extent that you give unselfishly of yourself to another, it cannot be an unpleasant experience. I shook my head. That explains it. That's why microman experiences so much guilt, anxiety, and frustration associated with sex, I said. He almost always uses sex for his own selfish purposes, so the result is bound to be something less than complete fulfillment. That's right, Carol responded. And even the micro view that sex is sanctified if it is used only for the purpose of creating children is false, because microman views his children as possessions, and thus uses them for selfish purposes not the least of which must be microman's hope for immortality through his children, I reasoned. Yes, Carol smiled. Man for centuries pursued what he called immortality, that celestial heaven where his eternity of days would be spent floating from cloud to cloud with a harp in his hand and a blissful smile on his face. He just had not yet evolved far enough along the M.M. continuum to remember his past lives. And if man can't remember his past lives, he can't be expected to understand the true concept of immortality. It would be like expecting a person who has been blind since birth to understand the color yellow. Many of your religions compounded this problem, she continued. Any religion that denies the human soul its immortal past is going to have difficulty teaching an immortal future. I thought about that for a bit, then said, I can see where that's one of the big problems of Christianity. That's right, Carol agreed. Any religion that depends on a priesthood for its truths is micro. Macro man learns truths by using his power of retrocognition to read the universal Akashic records, which contain a full account of everything that's ever happened. You mean, I question, if your personal Akashic record of your own past doesn't include something, you can check a universal Akashic record that does? Yes, she explained. It's like a universal CI that has a videotape of everything that has ever happened. Then you wouldn't have to be dependent on anyone else's interpretation of anything, I said. Instead of arguing about Lao Tzu, Gautama, or Jesus, or what they said, or didn't say, you could just check the universal Akashic records and both see and hear every event in their lives. Carol nodded and said, exactly. We've done this with all the great philosophers of history. My God, that sounds fascinating. Could you show me how to do that, Carol? Maybe today? I asked eager to tap this incredible new resource. It's up to you, John. I should warn you, though, that while using the Akashic Records, it's a great educational technique. It's not of much use in attaining greater macro-awareness. And that can only be achieved by tapping the same source of all wisdom, love, that the great macro-philosophers of all time have tapped, the macrocosm, or universal mind, then practicing through application in your daily life what you learned from that contact. I was disappointed to hear that this marvelous new experience which I was so eager to embark upon would not help me to reach my goal of level 3 awareness. It was with reluctance that I decided I could not afford to take time to learn this new skill until after I had reached my more important goal. 
Carol sensed my conflict, and after telepathic reassurance that she felt my decision was a wise one, she invited me to share an invigorating bath with her before joining the rest of our alpha for breakfast. After breakfast, Carol suggested that I could use CI in our room while she used the one at the center. I told her that I'd rather walk to the center and enjoy the beautiful lake and trees and the flowers under the clear blue sky of the some polluted world. I can read about your polluted world, she said, and I can see and hear videotapes of it in all its grimness. But only when I remember my past life during that period can I appreciate the beauty of our world. Hey, that's right. You lived your most recent past life in the 20th century, didn't you? You said you died in the 1990s, I recalled. Yes, she replied. In the 70s, I was a student. I took every opportunity to protest the criminal contamination of our planet. In spite of popular protests, the vested interests had their way till the pollution of the 80s made that of the 70s look very mild indeed. Then it just got worse and worse, I said, and nothing was done to correct it? Oh, lots of little things were done, she responded, but it was too late for halfway measures. It would have required worldwide cooperation through a worldwide government, but this was impossible for Microman with his micro-philosophy of life. Unified world government requires a macro view with equal concern for the health, safety, and well-being of all mankind. Microman was not willing to make the sacrifices necessary to achieve this goal. I guess, I said, I'm using a micro-perspective when I feel sorry for Microman's suffering and miserable death. I know that it was the only way he could learn the consequences of his selfish micro-ways, but I still feel remorse about the tragic deaths. Carol responded, saying, Microman had to perish so that Macroman could be born. Death is only bad when it's taken out of context of the soul evolution and the cumulative macro effect. As we talked, I had left our gamma building, and we were walking beside the lake toward the center, when suddenly I stopped and pointed at a figure on the lake. Look, Carol, I said, surprised. Is that really someone walking on the lake? Yes, she replied. It's probably a level eight or nine practicing levitation. Well, why not a ten? I asked. <laughs> because, she answered, they don't have to practice. The figure had been too distant for me to get a close look at levitation, but it soon disappeared into the water. I guess whoever it was got tired, I postulated, and is now taking a bit of a swim. Maybe, Carol replied, or maybe swimming just looked like it might be a little more fun. Why don't we try a little practice ourselves, and then you can learn to levitate too. With these words, Carol leaped into the air and floated about three feet above the ground for almost ten seconds before descending gently to the earth. I didn't realize that you were that advanced, I said. What sort of thought did you use? Well, I just visualized myself floating in the air, she replied. Hmm, I murmured. I guess I can at least try out. I did, and almost immediately landed back on the ground. Carol picked up my puzzlement and answered, You forgot to raise your vibrations by recalling macro contact, your macrocosmic oneness with all. I followed her suggestion until I felt joyously calm and very buoyant. But then I visualized myself about six feet off the ground and easily leaped to this height. I stayed up for almost five seconds before fatigue overcame me, then started to come down gently, but ran out of PK about two feet from the ground and landed with a thud. I was thrilled with my unbelievable success. I mean, just think of it, me, John Lake, levitating. Wow! I decided that I could just as easily visualize myself at 30 feet off the ground or even higher if I was willing to come back down right away. However, I was too tired from my first effort and postponed any further attempts until I was completely rested. I'll bet I could set a new world record at high jump back in 1976 if I wanted to, I observed. By golly! I'd be right in time for the Olympics, too, Carol replied. A new world record in pole vaulting, too. And you wouldn't even have to use the pole. However, Microman gets pretty frightened of anyone who does things far out of the ordinary, so I suggest you be careful. Yeah, I said. And when Microman is frightened, look out. I wouldn't want to be locked up as a freak or a national defense resource. Carol nodded. Microman does have a tendency to hate anyone who makes him feel inferior. That's why our visits to Micro Island are so dangerous for those who do not have pretty well-developed macro powers. Speaking of Micro Island, I said, I want to visit there as soon as you feel our combined macro powers will protect us. All right, Carol answered as we reached my CI room. I'll tell you when I think we're ready. Then she squeezed my hand affectionately and said, See you at lunch, and was gone down the long corridor. 
As soon as I was seated in my favorite CI room overlooking the lake, I began asking CI questions about the use of macro powers to help micro man. Over and over, CI kept telling me that no one can be helped until they are both willing and ready. This was the same as having sufficient desire and belief, she said. When I asked specifically how I could help Nada, I learned that PK could be used to affect the seven gland centers of the body and thereby cause changes in physical appearance. I spent the rest of the morning studying diagrams of the glandular system and learning all I could about how to use PK to change Nada's physical appearance to one of greater attractiveness. It seemed overwhelmingly complex and difficult to understand at first, but CI was the greatest resource ever, with an unending supply of patience. By noon I felt hopeful about my chances of changing Nada's appearance for the better. When Carol joined me, we took our CNs with water, then walked toward the recreation areas. On the way, we practiced our PK with pebbles again, and I told Carol about my hopes for Nada back in 1976. She agreed this would be a good application of my growing macro powers. As I was about to take my next step, I stopped in mid-stride, for there before me, basking itself in a pool of sunshine, was a snake about six feet long. Carol obviously hadn't seen it, for she was about to walk on. I grabbed her arm and pulled her to me. She looked at me with surprise, then, remembering how new I was at all this, reassured me, saying, It's all right, John, I'm not afraid, therefore the snake won't harm me. Carol took my hand, and I, somewhat reluctantly, permitted her to lead me closer until I had a clear view of the rattles on the tail. I stopped and said, Maybe a rattlesnake won't harm you, Carol, because you're not afraid, but I, for one, am damned scared. Then stay here, she suggested, and I'll show you something. With these words, she walked up to what looked to me like a deadly rattlesnake, bent over, and put her hands underneath it, gently lifted it in her arms, and began walking toward me. My mouth was dry. Sweat seemed to spurt out of every pore in my body. My heart pounded under the impact of more adrenaline than my sister could handle. There was no doubt in my mind that snakes had always frightened me, and this one in Carol's arms was no exception. Then for the first time I heard the ominous rattle begin, and saw the snake's head jerk back in striking position, its eyes fastened with deadly menace upon me. No closer, Carol, please, I stammered, backing away. She stopped and began talking soothingly to the by now intensely angry snake in her arms. Surprisingly, in a very few seconds, the sound of the frantic rattling ceased, and I could see the snake's tightly coiled body begin to relax. As I watched this seeming miracle unfold before me, I realized that once Carol had picked the snake up, I had been convinced no harm would come to her, even when the deadly reptile was at his angriest. My fear had been for myself. I was filled with shame and embarrassment. I don't blame you for being afraid, Carol said. Obviously, you've suffered great pain and anguish, possibly death, from contact with snakes in past lives. The fear generated then was so powerful that it has stayed with you. I can believe that, I replied. As far back as I can remember, I've always been afraid of snakes. Obviously, this one has recognized my fear and responded to it. That's right, John, she agreed. No animal can attack a person who is demonstrating macro love. Okay, I acknowledged. Macro man isn't afraid. But obviously, I'm not very macro in this area. Is there anything I can do about that? Sure, Carol answered. Since you've already experienced macro contact, you have only to remember it sufficiently to have all your fear removed from your mind. You can't be afraid of yourself. I was skeptical of this answer, and in the end, it was only because of my telepathic contact with Carol that I succeeded in perfecting the recall. Then I maintained a very strong telepathic bond, which continued to support our macro contact memory, as, after almost 45 minutes, I was finally able to approach the snake, touch it, and even hold it in my hands. It was, of course, my own doubt that caused me to have such difficulty. We placed the snake back in its sunning spot and continued on our walk. I asked Carol if she would thought I was cured of my fear of snakes. She laughed and told me that it wasn't all that easy, but having experienced such a successful confrontation with my phobia, the fear would be greatly diminished. If I practiced for a while, dealing with it as we had, it would soon be gone. I had to admit that I had never imagined it would be possible for me to hold a live poisonous snake in my hands without fear. Then I asked Carol about other wild animals. She told me that during the planetary pollution and overpopulation crisis, many types of animal life had died off. However, the early macro society had preserved as many species as it could. Now, most animal life had made a remarkable comeback from almost complete extinction, for man had finally ended his relentless destruction of them and their food chain. 
I was pleased to hear that even the great cats, such as the leopard, tiger, and lion, had survived. But what will you do if they become too numerous, I asked. Oh, she said, we control the total ecological balance of our planet, not by killing, but by maintaining a balance of nature so that no species overbreeds for very long. Speaking of overpopulation, I said, you know, I'm really surprised that I haven't seen more people during our walks to the center and to the recreation areas. Why is this? We don't need to crowd each other, Carol replied, because we're not afraid of being alone. With telepathy, we need never be alone, and we need never invade the mental or physical privacy of others without their consent. Besides, you haven't seen much of our delta, only the student gamma area. That's true, I agreed. Although on my first visit, I wandered for some time through your gardens and woods, yet Leah was the only person I saw. Don't forget, Carol reminded me, each delta has a hundred square miles of living space, devoted mostly to wooded parkland. 10,000 people can live very uncrowded lives in our deltas if they live them in a macro fashion. Someday, I said, I must walk around the lake and see all the other gamma buildings. Well, why don't we do it now? Carol asked. Well, I answered, if I remember correctly, the lake's five miles long and two miles wide. So from where we are now, it'd be a rather long walk, over 15 miles. And I wanted to join Neil and Jean today. Well, we can do both, Carol replied. We'll just run most of the way using macro contact energy. You mean, I ask, every time we get tired, we recall our last macro contact and renew our energy supply while at the same time washing away our fatigue? Well, sort of, she answered. What we'll do is maintain a constant macro contact memory, which will allow us to use a little PK to run very lightly and fast. Imagine your body weighing only a few pounds, and then imagine that the force of gravity is much less, only about one-tenth its usual force. At first, all this seemed complicated, and I had a lot of difficulty believing it was possible. I got off to a mighty funny-looking start, but after we got going, I was able, through our telepathic contact, to see how Carol was using her mind. Then by the same telepathic bond that had finally enabled me to overcome my fear of the snake, I learned how to run as I had seen Leah run on my first visit to 2150. For a person who's always loved running, this experience of almost flying through the air as we bounded along with the stride of a colossus interrupted with occasional leaps of pure delight that must have covered at least 50 feet was the ultimate in physical expression. Our speed varied as we passed such points of interest as the other gamma buildings, for then we could slow our pace so we could look around. I was seeing more people than ever before. We wove our way around the gamma buildings First, we ran along the lake shore, admiring the lovely stretches of sandy beaches on which many of the handsome members of the macro society were playing and swimming nude in the sunshine. They sent us telepathic greetings and welcomed me to 2150. Then we ran past the shrubbery and flower gardens through the parklands behind the gammas until we came to a large vegetable garden that was maintained by each gamma. Still, we saw relatively few people. Even when we passed the large gamma buildings, which I knew housed a thousand people, there would be only a handful of people outside around them. It was only when we came to the large recreation areas, which seemed to be shared by two gammas, that we saw more people. Even here there were no large crowds, hardly more than a hundred people in any one of the huge recreation areas. I was pleased that from a planet that had almost died from overcrowding, Macroman had truly re-established a balanced population. And yet, ironically, Microman's ideal of the single-family house had been given up completely. When we came to the administration building at the end of the lake, I realized that I must have run at least six miles, yet I didn't feel at all tired, more exhilarated than anything else. I appreciated the rows of tall trees surrounding this building. Then I saw, coming out of its central entrance, the smallest man I had yet encountered in 2150. He was no more than six feet tall, and as we approached him I noticed signs of aging. Raina had looked forty-five, but this man looked at least fifty-five. As we stopped before him, Carol took his left hand and greeted him affectionately. He then greeted me in his traditional manner, saying, Welcome to Delta 927. I'm Hugo, your Deltar. I liked him immediately and was not surprised that the Delta had chosen him as their leader, for he had tremendous warmth and quiet strength. Thank you, I said. Can't tell you how happy I am to be here. Carol told him of our journey around the Delta Lake. Then he answered my unspoken question about his age. I have had 197 years, he explained. I was born in Brazil in 1953. Yes, I could look younger, but I grew up in a time when people aged, and since I shall soon evolate, I have permitted myself to age also. You mean you're planning on dying? I asked with surprise. 
I remembered that C.I. had once told me that when Macro Society members decide that they have learned all that they can learn in any particular incarnation, they break the connection between their astral and physical bodies, causing the latter to die, while the soul is then free to evolve to the next level of the M.M. continuum. They call this process evolation. Suicide meant running away from the past. Evolation, a contraction of evolve and graduation, meant embracing the future. Yes, I want to join my twin souls in another dimension, he answered. Besides, I've accomplished all I can in this lifetime, and it's time to move on. He laughed at my uncertain expression and continued, saying, You don't need to worry, John. I'm not planning on evilating immediately. In fact, it'll be some months yet before my successor is chosen, and of course, I couldn't leave until the new Deltar is ready to take over. I told him that I hoped I would see him again in this lifetime. Then we continued our run. Along the other side of the lake, I noticed that there were more people swimming and playing on the beaches. Carol explained that mid-afternoon was the favorite time for outdoor recreation. She asked if I wanted to speed up our journey in order to join Neil and Jean sooner. I replied, how much faster can we run? Lots faster, she replied. Just think lightly and swiftly. We did, and veered from the lake shore to the less populated park area behind the Gammas. Our running soon became close to a form of low flying. I didn't know how fast we were going, but in an incredibly short time we had completed the full circle of the lake and arrived at the third Alpha's recreation area. Less than an hour had passed since we started our run, and while I felt some fatigue, I was not at all uncomfortable. In fact, after waiting a few minutes while Neil and Jean finished playing soccer, we resumed our tennis game, this time with a stipulation that the first set would be played without the use of PK. Without PK, Jean and I won the first set, but just barely. Then, in the next two sets, in which we used our PK, I was pleased that, while we lost, it was much closer than it had been the day before. I was making progress, even faster than I had hoped. After tennis, we again took a dip, followed by a fascinating but very complex game similar to three-dimensional chess, which was played as a team sport. Because of my inexperience at this game, Carol and I played the two children, and again I was amazed at the remarkable intelligence of these two seven-year-olds. They beat us three straight games. But at least by the last game I was catching on to some of the intricate complexities, and we came very close to winning. Then it was time to return to our gammas and our individual alphas for the macro dance. Again we were running, but this time with Jean by my side and Neil just ahead of Carol. Never had I seen children run so swiftly. I was sure that these seven-year-olds could easily break every track record of my twentieth century. We waved goodbye at the interest of our gamma. And as we made our way to our respective alphas, there were telepathic reminders of what we would do together tomorrow. Back in our alpha, I was soon engaged for the second time in the energetic and delightful combination of ballet, folk dancing, and gymnastics called the macro dance. The exciting musical accompaniment was supplied by CI through a speaker system so designed that the music seemed to emanate equally from all parts of the room. With my growing telepathic skills, I was able to keep up with more of the flashing ins and outs and other dazzling swift interactions of the others in the room. I was no longer surprised to find Joyce on my shoulders or Alan throwing me in the air or the tumbling over and under each other that occurred so regularly. Utilizing our telepathic bond, I knew what was coming and was more or less prepared to accept what I had at first thought were impossible physical gyrations for the human body. While my first experience with the macro dance had left me bewildered and doubting the evidence presented by my own eyes, I was now prepared to accept the macro powers as non-miraculous, though thrilling and surprising. However, the day's demands on my PK had been strenuous, so after about 15 minutes I found myself very tired and grateful that my alpha had ended the dancing early in deference to my fatigue. I was soon floating comfortably in our beta swimming pool, perfectly content to just watch the energetic water activities of the other 99 members of my beta. There was no doubt in my mind that I was viewing the greatest athletes the human race had ever produced, and I was sure that my comrades had reached the limits of physical grace, dexterity, and superhuman stamina. A few couples were playfully making love as they enjoyed the rhythm of the moving waters supporting their united bodies. Carol dove underwater, and as her wet breasts found their way up my thighs to my chest, her legs wrapped around me, and we joined together joyously. Appreciating the uninhibited joy of love expressed openly and freely, I made a mental note to apologize to Carl and Cindy. 
Before we left the pool, Leo, our Beitar, organized a type of water ballet, a game that was breathtaking to watch. I vowed that tomorrow I would become a part of this activity, too. After dinner, I listened to my alpha doing some magnificent singing and discovered that Nancy and Steve had voices that would have been the envy of our greatest opera singers in the 20th century. To provide musical accompaniment, they merely asked C.I. to give them whatever they wished in the line of music, since C.I. had recordings of every imaginable kind. Carol explained to me that they ended most evening meals with a song, and it was only because of my arrival and our lengthy conversations that I had not heard them sing until tonight. I could have listened to them sing all night, and even discovered that I was able, with the aid of telepathy, to join in some of the songs. However, long before I was ready to end it, Alan was saying that it was time for tutoring, and I was leaving for my visit with Raina. I was pleased that we would be meeting with her this evening, since I planned to ask her to use all of her macro power to help me attain my third macro contact. Raina immediately picked up this intention of mine, or perhaps she had precognitively anticipated it, because she asked me how I thought she could help me attain macro contact. Well, I, I don't know, I answered, feeling rather surprised at her question. But after all, you are level 10, and if anyone should know how to help me, you should. Yes, Raina replied, but last time we met, I told you that it is desire and belief that determine all things. No one can give you these two essentials. All right, I said. But I thought, if I could establish a strong telepathic bond with you, that when you establish macro contact, I would be able to make it more easily myself. Raina shook her head. It won't work with you and me, because our soul notes are too dissimilar. However, it might work with Leah, if you could completely eliminate all resistance. But, once again, we're back to desire and belief. Even telepathically connected to Leah, you would fail to attain macro contact if you didn't have sufficient desire and belief. What's more, you would then interfere with your twin soul attaining macro contact. Of course, since Lee has been using her macro powers to maintain your time-space translation, she has not been able to attain macro contact at all. Perceiving my thoughts, Raina said, No, John, there is no easy way, at least none that I know of, and I spent many lifetimes looking for them rather than accepting the responsibility for my own personal growth or lack thereof. I didn't remember much of what happened during the rest of our meeting with Raina, I was a little embarrassed and more than a little disappointed. Later that evening, as I was ready to go to sleep, I realized that ever since Raina had told me that she couldn't help me the way I wanted to be helped, I had been in a fog of depression. Carol, of course, picked up on this and said something about all depression being the product of repression. I wasn't really listening very closely, for my mind was again wrestling with the seemingly impossible task of attaining level three in just three months. Once again, I failed to attain macro contact, which so frustrated me that I then failed at attaining macro immersion. I lay awake for a long time thinking of my failures and of the task before me.